Welcome back. This week, we are checking back in to the Petito versus Laundry civil lawsuit that's going on down in Florida. You may remember the disappearance of Gabby Petito and the eventual determination that she had been murdered by her then boyfriend, Brian Laundry, who was also subsequently found deceased um, at his own hand. The parents of the two individuals are now in a civil lawsuit that is getting ready to be back in court for a hearing on Wednesday, May 24th. So after this episode goes live, there will be a court hearing. We're going to talk about what is going on in that civil case. So we need to just get in to today's episode. Welcome to The Emily Show. I'm Emily D. Baker, the internet's go-to legal analyst and big fan of the cursey words. I've been a licensed attorney for over 17 years. I'm a former prosecutor, and I break down the legal side of pop culture and entertainment stories we can't stop talking about. We should just get into it. Let's go. Before we get all the way in to today's episode, which is on a more difficult topic, I am very thankful for our sponsor, Manscaped, because they are making sure that the topic of Father's Day is not difficult for you. June is just around the corner. And dad, if you listen to the podcast, I'm so sorry, but maybe a nose hair trimmer for your dad. Not my dad, of course. We're not going to talk about my dad's nose hair. I use the nose hair trimmer all the time. I think it's absolutely fantastic. But if you are ready to help your dad get into the groom or for the father in your life or just for the daddy in your life, if you're ready for a gift, The gift of Manscaped is incredible. And of course, Manscaped also offers the Beard Hedger, which is a fantastic package that comes with beard oil and all of the grooming things you need for the hair up there. So if you are ready to have Father's Day handled for the daddy in your life, get 20% off and free shipping with code LAWNARD at manscaped.com. That's 20% off and free shipping at manscaped.com dot com with code lawnard. All right, let's get back into today's episode. The disappearance of Gabby Petito really was a story that just gripped the nation in a way that I have seen few stories do true crime or otherwise. But news started coming out in August, September 2021 that Gabby Petito was missing. And then it came out that her uh, fiance had gone back to Florida in the van that was hers. And then he went missing, but he had gone on vacation with his family. There was a ton of hostility towards his parents. A lot believe and still believe that they knew more than they had shared and knew more than they had shared with the Petito family, even though Gabby Petito had lived with the Laundry family, was engaged to their son, and the Petito family since filed a civil lawsuit against the Laundry family. The Petito versus Laundry lawsuit has now gotten to a second amended complaint, and in that second amended complaint, they have looped in the Laundry family attorney, Stephen Bertolino, and you might recognize that name because he was regularly talking to uh, the news media. He was releasing statements. And one of the statements that he released is the subject of the civil lawsuit. So today we are going to take a look at that second amended complaint. And then we are going to look at the subject motions that are coming up for hearing on May 24th. There is a hearing regarding requests for discovery that are quite interesting. Have you heard about this letter that Roberta Laundry allegedly said burn after reading? We're going to talk about that and how it loops into all of this. There's now a subpoena out for what the FBI might know and what was turned over to them. And there's also a motion for a protective order with regard to a lot of this discovery. So Between the motion for protective order and the motion to compel discovery, there's a lot happening in this civil lawsuit. But since it's been, and when I looked back at this, I was stunned. It's been over a year since I've covered this civil case. 
I thought it would be helpful to go over that second amended complaint so we all know what we're talking about now that the attorney, Stephen Bertolino, is also being sued. It's a very interesting thing where Stephen Bertolino is being sued for things he said on behalf of his client. At the very first hearing that was public in this civil case, we saw the judge make mention of the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case and the way that Johnny Depp was sued over statements that the attorney made. So whether or not someone can be sued for statements the attorney makes or whether the parties themselves can be sued is going to be critical in this case. There have been multiple motions to dismiss the second amended complaint. Those are still pending. I will cover those motions as we get closer to hearing because Stephen Bertolino is trying to get this case thrown out and, well, at least get himself removed from this case. So that's what we're covering today. Hopefully, this is a case that, A, you remember a bit. If not, I will link, of course, all of my coverage of this case down below. It really is the entire circumstances surrounding the disappearance and eventual um, locating of Gabby Petito are absolutely tragic. The pain that a family is going through, they are arguing, was amplified by the lack of the laundries giving them information. And whether or not you can sue over that seems to be said. And so I have a tremendous amount of empathy for the Petito family because I completely understand their rage. I don't know if the law provides them a remedy for that. So this is going to be an episode where we are parsing between the, you know, the feelings and the emotions and the rage and the outrage of the thing and the law and then really the morality and the legality of the thing. Because I don't know if the law provides a remedy here. And I don't know where there's a duty. And we're going to continue to see that. But this might very well be exactly the type of case that needs to go to a jury. Because our juries help us decide how the law applies to different circumstances. So if on its face there is legal sufficiency for the case to go forward to a jury, the jury gets to decide if this is the type of situation that the law accounts for and that the law provides a remedy for. And then if one party doesn't like the result, it can go to the appellate court and they ask the appellate court to decide it. And that's how we really test the understandings of the laws that are on the books. You let the jury decide. This is why a local jury is so important because when we look at the complaint here, and we're going to look at the types of charges, one of them is for outrageous conduct. Well, who decides what is outrageous? And that's really what a jury is for. It's the same when you look at defamation. If it's pled legally sufficient, it really needs to go to a jury to decide. And that's all of what we're talking about today. I appreciate that we have sponsors in today's episode. We're going to take breaks for that throughout because it allows me to talk about topics that are maybe a little bit more sensitive and still provide you with great content. So a huge thank you to today's second sponsor as we get in to this complaint. A thank you to our sponsor, Jenny Kane, who is making it easier to find what you love for your home. It is your one-stop shop for handcrafted furniture and home decor. What I love about Jenny Kane is the entire vibe is about well-made, timeless, and cozy pieces, which is exactly what I want when I come home. I find shopping for home decor to be really overwhelming with too many decisions, and I love that everything I find at Jenny Kane can be easily incorporated into my house. I have been loving my Jenny Kane blanket that I keep talking about, I've been wrapping up in it when I get too chilly with the air conditioning because it's that time of year. And with pieces starting at just $25, there really is something for everyone. 
So go and find your forever pieces now at jennycane.com slash home. Emily Show listeners get 15% off your first order when you use code Lawnard at checkout. That's 15% off your first order at J-E-N-N-I-K-A-Y-N-E dot com slash home. Jenny Kane, in neutrals, we trust. Let's get back to today's episode. All right. What we are taking a look at is a motion for leave to file a second amended complaint asking the court to allow for that. This was filed December 6, 2022. And on January 26, 2023, the court allowed for the amended complaint and the amended complaint was filed. But it gives a good rundown of what has happened. And again, this is a civil case between Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt, Gabby Petito's parents, versus Christopher Laundrie and Roberta Laundrie, Brian Laundrie's parents. So in this, they are asking the court to add Stephen Bertolino. They say that plaintiffs initiated or instituted the within action by filing a complaint against defendants on March 11th, 2022. Defendants filed a motion to dismiss plaintiff's complaint on March 30th, 2022, On April 13th, an order was entered granting plaintiffs leave to file an amended complaint. Plaintiffs subsequently filed a first amended complaint on April 28th, 2022. Defendants filed a motion to dismiss the amended complaint on May 13th, 2022. The motion was denied by order on June 30th, 2022. So normally that would just scoot forward towards discovery and trial. However, they say plaintiffs are desirous of filing a second amended complaint to name Stephen Bertolino as defendant. And again, the court allowed this. So here is the attached second amended complaint that has now been filed, including Stephen Bertolino as a defendant in this case. This is a action for damages that exceed $30,000 exclusive of prejudgment interest cost and attorney's fees. That is a jurisdictional amount. I'm sure this is an amount to be proven at trial, but there needs to be an amount to move you into the proper type of court or the unlimited court, not in the limited court. This is filed in Sarasota County, Florida. The court has jurisdiction. They talk about who the parties are. Defendant Stephen Bertolino is a resident of the state of New York and is a lawyer licensed to practice law in New York. Yet, the Petitos are seeking to sue him in Florida based on actions he took while he was in New York in his representation of the laundries who are individuals in Florida. They say that this court has personal jurisdiction over him. We will see when we cover the motions to dismiss. At all times relevant, Stephen Bertolino was acting as an agent for Christopher Laundry and Roberta Laundry, And this was the argument in the inverse in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case when Amber Heard argued that Johnny Depp as the client was responsible for the things the lawyer said. Here they are alleging that the lawyer is responsible as an agent for the clients. It goes on to say Brian Laundrie and Gabby Petito or Gabrielle Petito were engaged to be married on or about July 2nd, 2020. On July 2nd, 2021, they left New York in a van owned by Gabby to take a trip to the Western United States, which was expected to last for several months. Prior to the trip taken, Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt and Christopher Laundry and Roberta Laundry had a cordial relationship. Gabby Petito had hopes of becoming a travel influencer, a quote unquote van lifer, and document her cross country travels on social media sites such as YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok because they're fascinating videos to watch. I can understand, I can't understand wanting to live it. I can understand wanting to make content about it and other people enjoying watching it. I love those videos. I'm fascinated. Could I know? But do I love seeing other people do it? Yes, I do. They said that during the course of the aforementioned trip, Gabby Petito called her family almost daily, including her parents. The last communication that Gabby Petito had with her father was on August 21st, 2021. The last communication that her mother had was on August 27th, 2021. It's believed that on August 27th, Brian Laundrie murdered Gabby Petito. The cause of her death was blunt force injuries to the head and neck with manual strangulation. Gabby Petito was 22 years of age at the time of her death. After Brian Laundrie murdered Gabby Petito, Brian Laundrie sent text messages back and forth between his cell phone and Gabby Petito's cell phone in an effort to hide the fact that she was deceased. On August 27th, 2021, it's believed that Brian Laundrie sent a text to Nicole 
Gabby Petito's mom, in which she referred to Gabby Petito's grandfather, Stan, by name. Gabby never called her grandfather by his name. It's believed and therefore averred, pled in this pleading, um, that on or about August 28th, 2021, Brian Laundrie advised his parents, Christopher Laundrie and Roberta Laundrie, that he had murdered Gabby Petito. On August 29th, 2021, Christopher Laundry and Roberta Laundry spoke with Stephen Bertolino and sent him a retainer on September 2nd, 2021. On August 30th, 2021, Brian Laundry sent a text message from Gabby Petito's phone to her mother stating that there was no service in Yosemite Park in an effort to deceive her mother into believing that she was still alive. On September 1st, Brian Laundry returned to the home of his parents, Christopher and Roberta, driving Gabby Petito's van. After this point in time, there was no contact between Gabby Petito's parents and the Laundries. On August 27th, 2021, until September 19th, when Gabby Petito's remains were found at the Spread Creek Dispersed Camping Area in Wyoming, plaintiffs were extremely distraught and attempting to locate Gabby Petito. While Petito's family was suffering, the Laundry family went on vacation at Fort DeSoto Park on September 6th and 7th. They went on vacation knowing that Brian Laundrie had murdered Gabby Petito. Again, these are the allegations made. They are going to have to try to prove that um, when they get to the claims here. And we will get to uh, the claims in a bit. They say they went on vacation knowing that Brian had murdered Gabby Petito. It is believed that they knew where her body was located and further knew that Gabby Petito's parents were attempting to locate her. In an effort to avoid any contact with Gabby's mother on or about September 10th, Roberta Laundrie blocked Gabby Petito's mom on her cell phone such that neither phone calls nor texts could be delivered and then blocked her on Facebook. On September 13th, 2021, the date Brian Laundrie left his home, according to a televised interview with Stephen Bertolino, on or about October 23rd, 2021, Brian Laundrie was quote unquote grieving. According to the Cambridge English Dictionary, grieving is defined as feeling sad because someone has died. I remember Stephen Bertolino using those words. They were odd, weren't they? Going back to the complaint, it says on September 14th, with full knowledge that Gabby Petito had been murdered by Brian Laundrie, and it is believed that they knew the whereabouts of her body, Stephen Bertolino, on behalf of Christopher and Roberta Laundrie, issued the following statement. It is our understanding that a search has been organized for Miss Petito in or near Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. On behalf of the Laundry family, it is our hope that the search for Miss Petito is successful and that Miss Petito is reunited with her family. I feel that the definition of reunited is going to play heavily in this case. For the Laundries and Stephen Bertolino to express their quote unquote hope that Gabby Petito was located and reunited with her family at a time when they knew she had been murdered by Brian Laundrie was beyond outrageous. We're going to get into the causes of action. Outrageous behavior is part of the causes of action alleged here. It's hard because will this count legally and will this count for a jury? And it might count for a jury and not for an appellate court. I want to know your thoughts on this as we continue to go through it. Stephen Bertolino, at the time he issued the September 14th, 2021 statement, was aware that the Petitos resided in Florida and that the statement was intended to reach Joseph Petito, Gabby's father. Um, sorry, just Gabby's father lived in Florida at the time. The September 14th, 2021 statement released by attorney Bertolino was intended to be disseminated na uh, nationwide and was broadcast in news reports in Florida and nationwide. On October 23rd, 2021, an interview was conducted by a reporter with WABC Channel 7 in Sarasota. At all times within the cause of action, Stephen Bertolino had sufficient minimum contacts with the state of Florida in that he was acting as an agent for the Laundries, who are residents of Florida. This is going to jurisdiction, so they're they're alleging within the complaint why Stephen Bertolino should be in Florida in court, even though he lives in New York, and they shouldn't have to sue him separately in New York. On September 16th, whether those will be sufficient minimum contacts, it will be interesting. They say that Stephen Bernalino engaged in substantial and not isolated activity in the state of Florida, which was continuous and systematic. 
him appearing on particularly Florida news cha channels and him um, taking maybe a monetary retainer from the laundries who live in Florida and deriving benefits from Florida and essentially working in Florida, even though he's not a licensed attorney in Florida, but working as a spokesperson. It'll be interesting to see how the court balances whether those are enough contacts to have minimum contacts with the forum jurisdiction. The news appearances, I will be curious to see how the court weighs because being on specifically local media, not national media, is a different thing. You know that you are engaging not with a, you know, an Associated Press, not with a um, court TV, but you are engaging with like a WFLA. You know that they are in Florida, things like that. On September 16th, 2021, attorney Richard Stafford, on behalf of the Petitos family, issued a letter to Chris and Roberta Laundry as follows. Quote, we are writing this letter to ask you to help find our beautiful daughter. We understand you are going through a difficult time and your instinct is to protect and your instinct to protect your son is strong. We ask you to put yourselves in our shoes. We haven't been able to sleep or eat and our lives are falling apart. We believe you know the location of where Brian left Gabby. We beg you to tell us as a parent, how could you let us go through this pain and not help us? As a parent, how can you put Gabby's younger brothers and sisters through this? Gabby lived with you for over a year. She was going to be your daughter-in-law. How can you keep her location hidden? You were both at Jim and Nicole's house. You were both so happy that Brian and Gabby got engaged and were planning to spend their lives together. Please, if you or your family have any decency left, please tell us where Gabby is located. Tell us if we are even looking in the right place. All we want is Gabby to come home. Please help us make that happen. That is the statement that they put out. I remember watching the press conference. It was and is heartbreaking. But did the laundries at that point have a duty to say anything? Did they have to say anything? Or did they have the ability to stay silent? And at this point, September 16th, they had not, um, you know, no action had been taken against Brian Laundrie. So if his family had said, well, we think she's located here, does that actually go towards showing that Brian Laundrie was the one who did this? Of course, this all changes after she's located, after Brian Laundrie is found um, having taken his own life. It's different. But at this point, there is like what a lot of you are probably feeling is a moral duty. And I understand that. But is there also a legal duty here? And interesting to me is at one point, Stephen Bertolino said he represented, I think, Brian Laundrie. And if that's true, is there an attorney client privilege with his parents? or with him, or did the parents, um, was he representing the parents and not Brian Laundrie? So then there's no attorney-client privilege with Brian Laundrie, who was an adult. It's very interesting to see because legal duty here is going to be different than the moral duty because it's, absol the, it's absolutely heartbreaking knowing that these, knowing these families were close. It goes on to say, despite the fact that the Petitos implored the Laundries to tell them if their daughter was alive and if she was not, where she was located, the Laundries refused to respond to either them, um, either Gabby's mother or father. While the Petitos were desperately searching for information concerning their daughter, the Laundries and Stephen Bertolino were keeping the whereabouts of Brian Laundrie secret, and it is believed were making arrangements for him to leave the country. Gabby Petito's remains were discovered on September 19th. On the same day, Stephen Bertolino issued a statement saying, the news about Gabby Petito is heartbreaking. The Laundry family prays for Gabby and her family. It goes on to say that the Laundries and Stephen Bertolino knew of the mental suffering and anguish of um, the Petitos. And I, I realize that Gabby Petito's mother's name is Nicole Schmidt. I keep referring to them as the Petitos because that is Gabby's last name, but yes, 
they have separate last names, but I do, I, I'm, I am trying to honor Gabby's name. Um, so Gabby's parents maybe would be better instead of saying the Petitos, but I keep defaulting to that. So it is not in disrespect to Gabby Petito's mother. Um, but I wanted to acknowledge that as we kept going on, for those of you reading along, we'll see that it is saying the names of both parents. I'm also trying to move through this document. So it alleges that the laundries and Stephen Bertolino knew of the mental suffering and anguish of Gabby's parents and not knowing the well-being or location of their daughter. I, I, I can't imagine, right? It's just, it's kind of the unimaginable there. And they further knew the mental suffering and anguish increased each day that Gabby was missing. The Laundries and Bertolino further knew that they could prevent such additional mental suffering and anguish of Gabby's parents by disclosing what they knew about the well-being or location of the remains of Gabby Petito and repeatedly refused to do so. It says in doing so, they acted with malice or great indifference to the rights of Gabby Petito's parents. So they then go through that the behavior under the circumstances goes beyond all possible bounds of decency and is regarded as shocking, atrocious, and utterly intolerable in a civilized community, including and without uh, limitation. And then they list the actions. And these are the actions going to the emotional distress claims in this complaint. Failing to advise them that Gabby Petito was deceased, failing to advise of the location of her body, taking a family vacation with their son who had murdered Gabby Petito while her parents were desperately seeking her whereabouts, blocking access to their cell and Facebook page, issuing a press release expressing, quote, hope that the search for Miss Petito is successful and that Miss Petito is reunited with her family. I think we're going to see the laundries arguing or Stephen Bertolino arguing that that could mean um, either Gabby Petito alive or Gabby Petito's remains. I think they will. I think they will argue that. Also saying that the statement September 19th is heartbreaking when they knew prior that she was deceased. So count one is Joseph Petito, Gabby's father, against Christopher Laundry, And that is a claim for emotional distress um, and the intentional infliction, negligent defliction of emotional distress. It's interesting because in Florida, in this jurisdiction anyway, they don't name out the count. They just name this plaintiff versus this defendant. And the anguish, the mental anguish, inconvenience, loss of capacity for enjoyment of life. Count two is Joseph Petito versus Roberta Laundry for the same. Count three is Joseph Petito, Gabby's father, against Stephen Bertolino for the same. Count four is Gabby Petito's mother, Nicole Schmidt, against Christopher Laundry. Count five, Gabby Petito's mother, Nicole Schmidt, against Roberta Laundry for the same. And these are all these. Um, infliction of emotional distress causes of action. And then count six is Gabby Petito's mother against the attorney, Stephen Bertolino. So that is the second amended complaint. We are going to go to the requests that are coming out of that complaint because there is a discovery request that not only raised a lot of eyebrows and you might've already seen it um, reported on, but then there's a protective order that comes from that that is also quite interesting. So what we are pulling up is a second request for production to defendant Roberta Laundry. The language in this is the same to Roberta Laundry and Christopher Laundry. Each one is served with this, but because Roberta Laundry answers this with an affidavit, I wanted to pull up hers because she is the one that answers it. This is very interesting. And all of this is being brought up to go to those emotional distress, infliction of emotional distress claims, showing that the behavior is outrageous. And again, there's going to have to be a duty to act here, a duty to speak up and say something. Often you don't have a duty to speak unless you are mandated to do so. So it is not an easy case 
legally for the Petitos. Morally, you let me know if you find the behavior outrageous as we get into this second request for production. I am not going to read all the terms. Lawyers love to define things. Good lawyers should define things. We need to know what we're talking about. They are seeking one thing in discovery, and I want to tell you what that is. So I'm not reading all the terms. If you want them, let me know. I will give you the terms. You can read You can read the request for production's terms. This is the request for production. Quote, please produce a copy of a letter written by Roberta Laundry to Brian Laundry, which letter states in part that Roberta Laundry would bring a shovel to help bury a body and which letter was contained in an envelope which said envelope stated, quote, burn after reading. The original of said letter was delivered to attorney Stephen Bertolino by the FBI on June 24th, 2022. So there is a letter. And this is what they are alleging is the contents of the letter. They want this letter, I imagine, to argue, see, they knew what was going on and were still making statements in public to dissuade discovery. That is going to be the argument here to a jury. If this letter is what it says it is, I don't know how a jury gets past this because how do you bring it? How do you feel about it? Let's go to how the laundries are responding to this because the Petito family is saying, this is the discovery that you need to give us. This is different than criminal discovery. It doesn't automatically get turned over. Civil discovery is a dogfight to quote Top Gun. It's like that. It is a battle. It is strategy and it is not easy. And it is a lot of what goes on in any case. But the request from the laundries was for a protective order. Let's see why they're asking for a protective order. Um, But I have to take a break for our sponsor. Our sponsors allow us to cover topics like this. So this one will be quick. Thank you. Thank you to our sponsor, Honey Love, who can help you feel more comfortable for that special event you have coming up this summer or just for day to day. And I enjoy Honey Love both for special events, for sleepwear, and for day to day bras and shapewear. Honey Love has revolutionized compression technology so you no longer feel that really uncomfortable, too tight feeling while wearing shapewear that makes you feel and look great. I really enjoy the V-neck bra that is just the smoothest thing in the back and front, and it makes everything look great. It is that convenient and flexible. And do not pass on their sleepwear. It is one of the favorite hidden finds from Honey Love. It is comfortable. It is cool. It is perfect for summer, and it keeps you all contained in case you have a kid running into your room in the middle of the night still happens sometimes at my house. So treat yourself to the best shaper on the market and save 20% off at honeylove.com using the code LAWNERD. That's code LAWNERD at honeylove.com for 20% off. Let's get back to today's episode. I also needed a quick break to just take a deep breath because I, I feel what you're feeling. And if you hadn't seen this when it was reported you are feeling all of this fresh this is what's going to be argued in court on wednesday afternoon that motion and this protective order so let's go to the motion for protective order now this is defendant roberta's laundry motions for protective order christopher laundry also makes the same motion because both defendants were demanded to turn over this letter so defendants the laundries move for a protective order for the second request for production, which requests a letter written by Roberta Laundry to Brian Laundry. In support thereof, defendants offer the following. Quote, unquestionably, the trial court possesses broad discretion in overseeing discovery and protecting the parties that come before it. 
upon proper application for good cause shown, the trial court may grant a protective order when justice requires. The rule is designed to, quote, protect a party or person from annoyance, embarrassment, oppression, or undue burden or expense. I imagine that the one that we're going with here is embarrassment and the rage of the internet. The the case law doesn't say the rage of the internet, but after people camped out outside of the laundry's home for weeks, I imagine that that is in their mind, even though it's not in the case law. Maybe one day we will see case law that says also the rage of the internet. The burden to show good cause lies on the party seeking the protective order. That's the laundry's. The court may order, among other things, that the discovery not be had, that certain matters not be inquired into, or that the scope of discovery be limited to certain matters. Defendants seek a protective order from the court protecting them from producing a letter written by Roberta Laundry to her son, Brian Laundry, which is specifically requested by plaintiff's second request for production. That is what they're seeking a protective order for. We knew that going into this. Well, I did. It goes on to say, as the court is aware, this case arises out of the undeniably sad circumstance where defendant's son, Brian Laundrie, killed plaintiff's daughter, plaintiff's daughter, Gabby Petito, after which defendant's son took his own life. This has been a truly heartbreaking experience for both families. They just had to get it in there and they're going to. I mean, that's all true. They have to, these attorneys are in the spot of having to represent their clients, the laundries well, but also needing to acknowledge how devastating this case is. This is an unenviable position for these attorneys. And I can empathize that these attorneys are like, I don't know legally if they have grounds here for an emotional distress civil cause of action. But also, if this goes to a jury, I don't know if a jury goes that way. Like, maybe you can can win on appeal, but I don't know how a jury see This is going to be hard for a jury because these facts are devastating. And I imagine therein lies the argument for the protective order. Lawyers doing their job when doing their job is not easy. They go on to say the public who followed the case and the plaintiffs are likely curious about the letter because of some of the language used makes it seem as though it is somehow related to Miss Petito's death. They say, however, Roberta Laundrie wrote this letter months before these events transpired. I have questions. Let's keep reading. Roberta Laundrie wrote the letter to Brian during a difficult period in their relationship. Whose relationship? Roberta and Brian's or Brian's and Gabby's because I have questions. As every parent knows your relationship with your child can have its periods of closeness and periods of distance. Roberta and Brian shared a love of stories and the language from the letters comes from stories and phrases that they both would have recognized. goes on to say the letter was Roberta's attempt to connect with her son and convey the strength of their relationship before he planned to leave home. It's an interesting way to express that you're a ride or die for your kid. Um, goes on to say Roberta would never have fathomed the events that would transpire between Brian and Gabby months later. At the time it was written, the letter was meant to be a lighthearted reminder of stories they shared together. Well, if you turn it over, they can argue that context to a jury. In hindsight, the letter may appear unfortunately worded, but that was never its intention. Therein lies the problem with the letter. They go on to say its origin has no relation to this case. Oh, they're trying to keep it from being disclosed altogether. But its publishing is embarrassing and most prejudicial to Roberta Laundrie. If the letter is produced in discovery, it will undoubtedly be made available to the media at some point. Probably. The media is already aware of Roberta's letter through plaintiff's filing of a letter to counsel in support of their motion to compel. And there's already been significant media commentary just about the mere reference of it. 
Hi, I'm giving commentary on the mere reference of it. Discovery is usually permitted only on matters that are relevant or that are reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. This is why the fight is going to happen in court. They are trying to keep the letter from being disclosed at all. Now, the court could, of course, have it disclosed in discovery under seal, but then they would have to fight about whether or not it comes up at trial. They are trying to keep this out of the hands of the Petitos, and the Petitos have already sent a subpoena to a Tucum, an SDT, D, the D goes first, SDT, subpoena deuces tucum, to the FBI. So I think they're also trying to get the letter from the FBI. But this is what the argument is going to be about on Wednesday. They go on to say the plaintiff's cause of action for intentional infliction of emotional distress. The elements are one, deliberate or reckless infliction of mental suffering. Y'all, can decide if you were sitting on a jury, you don't have all the evidence, I know. But these are the elements of this crime, or crime, Emily. The underlying thing is the crime. This is a civil case. The elements of this cause of action are deliberate or reckless infliction of mental suffering, outrageous conduct, which is why the complaint is pled the way that it is, that the conduct caused emotional distress, and that the distress was severe. They're going to argue, I imagine, that there was no deliberate or reckless infliction of mental suffering, that the conduct of remaining silent and saying nothing was not outrageous, and then the counter to that is going to be, but the attorney released that statement. That's why the attorney is here. The conduct caused severe emotional distress. These attorneys are going to have to argue to a jury that the conduct of the laundries didn't cause the distress. They are going to argue that the murder of Gabby Petito and the fact that she was missing caused the distress, not the laundry's actions. And then that the distress was severe. Again, I imagine they're going to argue. How do you even argue this to a jury? This is why you pick your cases carefully and civil, because they're going to have to argue that the distress of the Petitos was severe, but it wasn't caused by the laundries. This is why this letter is going to be such a fight. Because when you hear about this letter, what's the first thing you think? Is it, oh, fuck that. What? It might be. And if that's how you're feeling, it's not unreasonable that that's also how a jury is going to feel, given these circumstances. And the the jurors are going to also have to, you're going to have to find jurors that have never heard of this case. So the motion goes back to say, the letter was not written to the plaintiffs or published in such a way that they could have seen it during the relevant period of time alleged in the second amended complaint. Your Honor, the letter is not the outrageous conduct. They didn't even know about it. So it can't go to this cause of action is the argument. They said, therefore, it could not have caused them emotional distress. Records that did not result in specific acts or conduct alleged in the second amended complaint are irrelevant to the cause of action for IIED, intentional infliction of emotional distress. Furthermore, as Roberta Laundry did not intend for anyone other than Brian to view the letter, she could not have deliberately or recklessly intended the plaintiffs to experience distress by writing it. So they are arguing lawfully, Your Honor, this doesn't go to the cause of action here. As such, information would not support plaintiff's claim. The only purpose the letter could possibly serve is to embarrass Roberta Laundry. That is not an appropriate use of discovery. They go on to say the scope of discovery should be limited to the time period of August 27th, 2021 through September 19th, 2021, the time period between the death of Ms. Petito and when her body was found, as alleged in the second amended complaint and further limited to information related to the outward actions or comments of the defendants during that time period. However, I would argue 
that if these are the internal communications, it goes to prove what is said in the complaint that the Laundries knew that Brian killed Gabby. So it just depends on the letter. Defendants suggest that they produce the letter for the court in camera to review so the court can analyze the letter along with Roberta Laundry's affidavit. I think that's probably what's going to have to happen at this hearing is the court's going to have to review the letter. But Roberta Laundry submitted an affidavit in connection with this. And that's what we're going to look at right now. What does Roberta Laundry say in her sworn affidavit about this? But I do think the most reasonable thing is the court has to evaluate it. And the court has to decide if this falls outside the period of time for the cause of action that's claimed. And if so, it might not be discoverable. However, if it tends to show that Roberta knew that this is what happened, I think there's a big argument there to say, look, it shows the outrageousness of the conduct because they knew that she was already dead. So the details and the circumstances of this letter Matter tremendously, again, letting the court review it in camera seems to make the most sense to me. Let's look at this affidavit from Roberta Laundry. Let's see what Roberta Laundry has to say. Quote, I, Roberta Laundry, am a defendant in the above styled cause. I do hereby swear or affirm that. I fully understand the meaning of all the terms of this affidavit. I wrote the letter requested by plaintiff's second request for production. I wrote the letter to my son, Brian Laundry on or about the end of May, 2021. Although I do not know the exact date I wrote the letter, I do know that I wrote it and gave it to Brian before Brian and Gabby left Florida for New York, which was on June 2nd. Brian and Gabby went from Florida to New York before they went out West. The purpose of the letter was to reach out to Brian while he and I we're experiencing a difficult period in our relationship. I'm very curious as to what the difficulty was. That's a curiosity that might never be solved, but I think it could be relevant here depending on what they were fighting over. Brian and I always had a very open and communicative relationship, and in the months prior to the trip, our relationship had become strained. Brian and I share a love of stories, and some of the language in the letter was using similar phrases to describe the depth of a mother's love. Um, the two books that come to mind are The Runaway Bunny and Little Bear. I have a whole lot of questions. In addition, Gabby had given Brian a book called Burn After Writing, which contains printed questions on which uh, the reader responds by writing their answers on the page. The back of the book instructs the reader to create a secret book and then destroy by, quote, burn after writing. The bottom of the back cover says, write, burn, repeat. I also have questions. Did, where was the book recovered? <sighs> Brian, Gabby, and I often joked about this book and the importance of being able to express yourself. If you were embarrassed or simply did not want anyone to know your thoughts or feelings, then the book offered the perfect solution by telling you to burn it. This is where my message to Brian came from, and I wrote on the cover of the letter for Brian to, quote, burn after reading. In short, I was trying to connect with Brian and repair our relationship as he was planning to leave home, and I had hoped this letter would remind him how much I loved him. There were some other phrases that I used in the letter which are not found in the books I shared with Brian as a child, However, these phrases were common enough in our circle of friends and family to describe who you could turn to in the most troubling times of your life. While I use words that seem to have a connection with Brian's action, with Brian's action and his takings and his taking of Gabby's life, I think that's the first time I've seen the laundries publicly announce or 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 in a public fashion acknowledge that Brian took Gabby's life. Um, I never would have fathomed these events that unfolded months later between Brian and Gabby would reflect the words in my letter. What is in the letter? How did Brian taking Gabby's life reflect the words in the letter? Is this letter dated? The words in the letter could never have been a comment on that tragic situation as they were written so many months before. 
How do we know? My words to Brian were meant to convey my love and support for my son through a lighthearted and quirky reminder that my love for him was not diminished and could not be shaken by the miles of separation we would soon be faced with. It goes on to say in the affidavit, although a few of the words in the letter are being quoted by others as having a connection to this case, all of the words taken together in the context of the reason the letter was written show that there is no connection. In addition, there has been some speculation that this letter was in Brian's possession or in his backpack when he died, insinuating that I gave it to him as he left my home on September 13th, 2021. But that is not true because the FBI had the letter in their possession and questioned members of my family about it prior to October 20th, 2021, when my husband and I found Brian's remains in the reserve. There are still questions there. But they are saying that the FBI recovered the letter before they found Brian and the backpack. Was the letter in the van? Then it goes on to say, I repeat that the letter I wrote to Brian before he left with Gabby for their fatal trip, fate, sorry, fateful. <sighs> Hello, Freud, it's Emily. Fateful trip was nothing more than a private communication between myself and my son, and I never expected anyone else would read it. In some way, I did not want anyone else to read it, as I know it is not the type of letter a mother writes to her adult son, and I did not want to embarrass Brian. I have more questions now than I did before. What? That is why I wrote burn after reading on the envelope. And I knew that Brian would know what that meant. I am now appreciative that he actually kept it. Signed Roberta Laundry. So what the letter contains is a private letter. Roberta Laundry says that is not the type of letter a mother writes to her adult son, and she did not want to embarrass her son. The Petito family has said that this letter says something about bringing a shovel to help bury a body. I don't know if the letter is dated. If that factually cannot be determined, then it might be for a jury to decide. The argument here is that this should not be turned over in discovery because it's too prejudicial and not relevant to this case for intentional infliction of emotional distress. It is quite a lot. I remember the news coming out that there was a burn after reading letter. It's, I had thought that the burn after reading letter, and I might just be misremembering, was from Brian to Roberta and not the other way around. So it's very interesting to see the fight over this protective order. So before we finish and before this hearing happens on Wednesday, which is also the day this goes live, I want to just take a look at the response from the Petitos to the Laundries about the letter. This is a first look. I haven't looked at it yet. We're all going to learn together. I love a first look because, well, I haven't seen it yet. This is why I always say, Emily, keep reading because you never know what's going to happen. Plaintiff's response to defendant's motion for a protective order. On February 14th, plaintiff served a second request for production upon the laundries with one request as follows. And then they restate the request for the copy of the letter. On March 6th, the laundries filed a motion for protective order, which included an affidavit from Roberta Laundry regarding the letter. It is important to note at the outset, Roberta Laundry does not dispute that the letter was written and that counsel for the laundries has previously advised the court that the letter is undated. Wait, what? Oh. Well, there it is. 
Roberta said she wrote the letter. She's admitted that she wrote the letter. There's no like, this letter is forged. This letter was not written by my hand. It's, I wrote the letter. I just, it's not relevant. That was the argument. Counsel for the Laundries has previously advised the court that the letter is undated. Hmm. Doesn't that change what the court may do? The first problem with the Laundries motion they write is that it is entirely premised upon Roberta Laundrie's affidavit. It is no surprise that Roberta Laundrie has said that the letter has no relevancy to the underlying litigation. Yeah, because it'd be real fucking bad if it did. Right? So they're like, your honor, um, she's the party to the litigation. It goes on to say the affidavit is a self-serving document written by an adverse party, one with a bias and a personal stake in the outcome, who seeks to withhold a key piece of evidence. Does that summarize how you're feeling? Lawnard? Is that, does that just put a little bow on, on what you're thinking right now? They're saying the court is being asked to believe Roberta Laundry when she says that the letter was written prior to the time of Gabby Petito's murder and that it had nothing to do with the murder. The plaintiffs have not had an opportunity to cross-examine Roberta Laundry on her allegations. And furthermore, it is a jury function to evaluate the credibility of a given witness. Well, given that it's undated. Y'all date your letters. Uh, given that it's undated, I think it probably is a jury function, don't you think? unless the context of the letter are so clear that it was before they left within the body of the document, then I don't know how you get around turning this over and let the jury decide when Roberta says, I wrote it before, let the jury look Roberta in the face and let her be cross-examined and let the jury decide. Let the jury decide. This is, this is going to be a fact that is argued and... The jury is the finder of fact. This is supposed to go to trial this summer, by the way. Did I mention that at the beginning? I might not have. Apologies. Let's keep reading. The court is being asked to believe Roberta Laundry when she says that the letter was written prior to the time of Gabby Petito's murder and that it had nothing to do with the murder. The plaintiffs had not had an opportunity to cross-examine Roberta Laundry on her allegations. The Honorable Court cannot simply take Roberta Laundry at her word as to the time when the letter was written. The Laundry's argument is that Roberta Laundry says that the letter was written prior to Gabby Petito's death. That is not relevant, and therefore a protective order is appropriate. Oh, that it is not relevant, and therefore a protective order is appropriate. But none of the cases cited by the Laundries in support of their motion address credibility issues. Each of them is factually distinct from the issues in this case, they go on to talk about the trial court's broad discretion in overseeing discovery disputes, how a party may obtain discovery. And then they go on to say that the laundry's sole basis for seeking a protective order is that the letter is not relevant. Relevancy is not a ground, they say, for protective relief under Rule 1.280C. And then they cite the case law that corresponds. They say the laundry cite numerous cases in their motion, which are factually distinct from the instant matters. And then they cite the University of West Florida Board of Treasurers or Trustees, TRS, versus Habger. Plaintiff who had been a professor at the university and whose contract had been terminated filed a claim for tortious interference with a business relationship against a party she alleged interfered with her business relationship. She further alleged that this individual had spoken with the president of the university, and thus she sought to take the deposition of the president. The university filed a motion for protective order that included an affidavit that the president had only one conversation with Mr. Dickey four to five months prior to the time that the contract was terminated, and that this had no impact on the decision to terminate the contract. Based upon the affidavit that was filed, the court found that there was good cause to preclude the deposition of the president. As an aside, the apex doctrine set forth in Florida Rule of Civil Procedure 1.280H may preclude such dis, uh, deposition today. Interesting. So things have changed a bit, but they're saying this is distinct. This is not a party opponent. This is a third party. They go through a number of cases and seek to distinguish them, saying 
this is the case they cited. This why it's not. This is why it's not like our case. Through each of them, every single one, which I'm sure we'll hear before the court when they argue this on Wednesday. They say none of the cases relied upon by the laundries bases the relevancy argument on the credibility of one party who says the requested document is not relevant. The laundries get to, don't get to really determine relevancy unless they can prove the timing, but I don't think they can prove the timing. I think a jury has to decide that fact. I am being persuaded. I'm going to keep reading. The laundries argue that the letter was not published to the plaintiffs and thus it could not have caused them emotional distress. They are absolutely correct, but that is not the reason why plaintiffs seek the letter. I argued this when we were reading the other motion. Plaintiffs claim against the defendants is based on statements made by attorney Bertolino on behalf of himself in the laundries at the time when the defendants knew Gabby Petito was deceased. The letter in question written by Roberta Laundry to Brian Laundry references bringing a shovel to help bury a body and baking a cake with a shiv in it should Brian Laundry go to prison. There's new information in that sentence. Context matters. A reasonable inference is, is that the letter was written at a time when Gabby Petito was as yet unburied and Brian Laundry could go to jail for the crime of murder. <sighs> See, I can understand the ride or die colloquialism of, hey, I've got a shovel. I've had friends that have gotten divorced. I understand saying, girl, I got you. I have a shovel. Get a burner phone before you call me. I understand making those jokes with your friends, even though you know no one is going to do anything awful. But when the letter talks about bringing a shovel to bury a body and baking a case with a shiv in it, it's a little more pointed, isn't it? This is a much different circumstance. And why would you write this letter in happier times? And if this letter shows the state of mind that they knew that Gabby Petito was deceased, then you can argue to a jury, this is how we know that they knew when they made the statements that Gabby Petito was deceased. Look at what they put in the letter. They know that he's going to go to prison because he murdered her. That is why they are talking about it. And that goes to what did the laundries know when they were making the statements? Because the laundries state of mind when they're making the statements can go to whether it's outrageous. If they don't know Gabby Petito was deceased, it's different saying we hope she's reunited with her family. We don't know what's happening. That's a different circumstance than this. Or at least it seems to be. And a jury gets to decide whether the statements of Stephen Bertolino are deliberate or reckless, whether the conduct is outrageous, if you can prove to a jury or convince a jury that the statements are made when the laundries know that Gabby Petito is deceased, and in fact, they have offered to help their son break out of prison, you go a long way to arguing to a jury that this is deliberate or reckless in inflicting mental suffering on the Petitos a much longer way because you can prove that they knew. And whether or not that conduct is outrageous or whether or not they had no obligation to speak up, but that's going to be a heavier lift for the laundries to argue if a jury hears this letter. If this letter is being accurately portrayed, it gets a lot harder to argue for the lawyers, for the laundries. Because the more information I get, the more I'm like, how do you argue to a jury? How do you argue this to a jury as the laundry lawyer? And say, nobody ever thought that everyone would see it. 
this letter didn't cause emotional distress to the Petitos. How do you even start to argue that? Lawyers, pick your cases carefully. The motion says, now that I have soliloquied, I apologize. I apologize. The letter says the plaintiff's claim against defendants is based on statements made by attorney Bertolino on behalf of himself and the laundries at a time when the defendants knew that Gabby Petito was deceased. The letter in question written by Roberta to Brian references bringing a shovel to help bury a body and baking a cake with a shiv in it should Brian Laundry go to prison. A reasonable inference is that the letter was written at a time when Gabby Petito was yet unburied and Brian Laundry could go to jail for the crime of murder. If a jury were to find that the letter was written after Gabby Petito's murder, it is further proof that the Laundries and Bertolino were aware that she was deceased at the time the statements in question were issued. Yep, that's the argument. If it was not written at a time when Roberta Laundry knew that her son had murdered Gabby Petito, is it is at best an odd letter for a mother to write to a son, and Roberta Laundry's explanation for writing it is frankly unbelievable. It is within the province of a jury to decide whether Roberta is credible in her assertion as to when the letter was written and to determine the relationship, if any, to Gabby Petito's death. It is understandable that the Laundries would argue that the letter is embarrassing and most prejudicial to Roberta. Nevertheless, that does not mean it's not discoverable. The Laundries suggest that for the court to enter an order excusing Lawn Roberta from producing the letter, it would not prevent plaintiffs from inquiring as to the actions taken by the defendants and public comments made by them or on their behalf, but it certainly would preclude plaintiffs from obtaining a key piece of evidence and cross-examining Roberta Laundry about it. Finally, defendants suggest that the letter be produced to the court in camera. Plaintiffs suggest that nothing will be gained by that as plaintiffs and their counsel have already seen the letter and it is acknowledged that it is undated. Wait, they know what's in the letter? What's in the rest of the letter? Who showed it to them? Did the FBI show it to them? They need it in discovery so that they can introduce it as evidence. So that is why they are trying to get it. But apparently, they've seen the letter. There is no work product information, privileged material, private information such as financial or medical records or trade secrets Secrets in the letter requiring an in-camera review. Well, if they've already seen it, they're just trying to get the letter in discovery so they can use it as evidence. The fact that they knew what was in the letter beyond what had been reported in the media is new information to me, maybe new information to the defense, but they know what's in the letter. And they've now made a court document saying, hey, we know what's in the letter which gives further veracity to the things they said in this filing. This filing was made on May 5th. So that explains the subpoena out to the FBI. I imagine they're trying to get this letter in any other communications. This explains why the court hearing on Wednesday is going to be so important because this seems to me like an important piece of evidence. I'm not surprised that they're fighting over it. And this evidence is the kind of evidence that could force a settlement in this case. I don't think the Petitos are interested though. I don't think there's anything the Laundries could do for the Petitos to settle this case. This case feels like the type of case that has to let a jury decide. And given the fact that a previous motion to dismiss was denied by the court as to the, the Laundries, it'll be interesting to see how that motion goes against Stephen Bertolino. That motion's not been heard yet. It's not on the docket for Wednesday. I'll cover it when it is. Let me know how closely you would like me to cover this civil case. This is a very different type of a civil case. I have not seen a civil case like this before when the parents of a murder victim are suing the parents of the person who murdered her over the statements they made through their attorney during that period of time. This is a unique civil case surrounding a horribly tragic murder that never went to court because Brian Laundrie took his own life. So I'm not surprised that the Petitos are pushing this forward. And as I record this, I'm recording it with our members on the behind the scenes. And one of the questions that came in for the kids said, is this about liability or money or what, really? I think this is about telling the story to the public. 
yes, about liability, but also about vindication, because that's what really civil is trying to fix it. Nothing's going to fix the case or the fact that Gabby Petito was murdered. Nothing fixes that. But for the Petitos to say what you did in not telling us where our daughter was caused severe emotional distress to the point where we can sue you over it and have a court or a jury say you're right. What they did to you is unfathomable. It's outrageous. It is outside the bounds of a decent society, which is really the, the, the heart of that cause of action. This is intolerable. And having a court or a jury say that might feel like some justice. But would it create a duty for people to speak up where they don't otherwise have a duty? But this isn't a case where the laundries simply said nothing. They said something. But could a case like this encourage others to say nothing? I don't know. But it's worth the conversation because this is how our law gets fine-tuned. This is how we take laws that were written decades ago, sometimes, sometimes more, and apply them to circumstances that haven't had this law applied to them before. And we let juries decide. I'm very interested to see. Let me know if you are also interested this is a very difficult case to parse the legality and the morality because I think everyone has a tremendous amount of empathy for the Petitos here. And I think some have empathy for the laundries too because what do you do in that circumstance if your kid comes home and says, so this is what happened. But if you were feeling that way before, does the letter change that feeling for you? Do you think that the laundries should have told the Petitos what they knew? Or could that have been somehow insinuating that their son was guilty of this before they knew that he had taken his own life? Or did they know all along that that's what he was going to do? There are so many questions here, and I encourage you to keep asking the questions. So let me know what you think about this case. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being a law nerd. Thank you for having conversations about the law in difficult and emotional and tragic cases. This one is hard because I feel it. Just I feel it. Um, and I think you probably do too. So thank you for being a law nerd. All right, y'all take a deep breath. It is... Whew, this civil case is going to be as heavy as any criminal case that I've covered because at the heart of it, it really is a symbol, a civil case addressing a criminal case that never saw a courtroom. And with that, Lawnards, may your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your families be well. Hug them. Hug your kids. Just a hugs all the way around, hug your paw nerds, hugs to you from me on this one. And may the odds be ever in your favor. I will talk to you in the next one. And I will be covering this hearing over on my YouTube channel if you want to see how this hearing goes down. Bye. You can find more Law Nerd goodness in our private Law Nerd community over at lawnerdsunite.com. And if you want to stay up to date with everything I'm covering, you can follow me on social media at the Emily D. Baker. I stream on YouTube on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and I recap those streams for those of you a little pressed for time over on the Quick Bits podcast and Quick Bits YouTube channel. Thanks for being a law nerd.